Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Westside Fellowship Church. My name is Matthew. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here and uh, getting to join with our staff, our volunteers, and, and pretty much everyone who calls this their home church as we work together to share the love and the good news of Jesus with our friends, our families, our community around us. Uh, welcome. So glad that you could join with us. Uh, today is going to look a little bit different. It's the long weekend, so as you can probably imagine, there's a number of people away on holidays, and that includes a number of our musicians. And so we're going to actually have uh, some worship through video. One of our teams came in earlier in the week uh, on one of the evenings and recorded some music for us. And so uh, we're going to have that, but we will have a message as well from David Brandon after our worship time. Uh, if you're new with us, uh, extremely warm welcome to you. If you're here in, in person with us, please introduce yourself to, to myself or one of our, our staff members. And if you're watching online, please uh, go and uh, check out our website, westsidefellowship.ca, and go and use the contact page, uh, contact us page, if you have any questions or if there's any ways that we as a church can uh, help you get connected and get involved. Uh, this morning, we're going to have a, a service that's about 60 to 75 minutes. We're going to have some music. We're going to have a message from God's Word where we're going to be encouraged and challenged. And uh, it's just going to be a great time of us being together, worshiping our, our God and our Savior. So I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into our worship time. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness towards us. Uh, God, we continue to thank you for... Uh, the rain and the cooler weather. I know that uh, already it's only been a couple weeks without smoke, and it's very easy for us to forget that there are still fires going on. Uh, and that's all because of your grace. Uh, thank you so much for the continued moisture, that it is putting out fires, that it is creating stability again, that people can return to their homes. Father, thank you so much that we have the, the freedom uh, that we are allowed to gather together like this to, to worship you, to hear a message from the Bible, from your word, that you would uh, love us enough that you would come and encourage us and challenge us to trust and follow you a little bit more each day. And so, God, we ask for your blessing on our gathering to get today. Would you uh, allow the technology to work smoothly? Would you bless the kids as they're upstairs learning and growing uh, as followers of you? And would you also uh, just encourage us and challenge us to put aside the worries that we carry with us. Put aside those distractions, those things that would keep us from focusing our hearts and our minds on you. And would you help us to enter into worship? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
stop the Lord Almighty. Who could stop the Lord? Who could stop the Lord Almighty? Who could stop the Lord?
sing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever
lost in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and Amen. You can be seated. Well, again, welcome. So glad that you could join with us. Like I said earlier this morning, we're going to have a, a great message to hopefully encourage you and challenge you today. I'm going to invite David Brandon to come on up here. Uh, for those of you who don't know David, uh, he is one of our missionaries that we as a church support. Uh, but he's not necessarily a missionary in the traditional sense of always just, you know, going, living cross-culturally in another uh, country. He is one of those missionaries who invests himself and teaches and trains up uh, locals, local people in the communities, training them to then be pastors where God has placed them. And so uh, he's got his doctorate. He is uh, helping to train doctoral students and master's students and uh, getting them educated and equipped to lead local churches in a number of different countries all over the world. And it's actually been fascinating to see uh, David and with obviously COVID and everything like that going on, how he has been able to adapt and learn <laughs> to teach on Zoom and use all the technology. <laughs> Uh, I got to say, you give me hope. I hope that, uh, we, you know, when I'm older, that I can still continue to adapt as technology goes as well. So uh, kudos to you. I'm going to quickly pray for you, and then uh, we'll turn it over to you. Father, thank you so much again for David. Thank you for how you continue to use him uh, to teach and equip uh, individuals who will then go back to their home communities and bring the good news of you. God, would you continue to bless him? Uh, Lord, even uh, if that means uh, another year of not being able to go to these different countries in, in Africa, the Philippines, all over the place, Lord, would you bless him and would you continue to help him to have an incredible influence uh, through the technology that we have access to today? God, would you give him the words to speak to us today? Uh, we know that uh, even as he speaks, you are speaking to our hearts and our minds individually. And so would you open us up to what you want to speak to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Now, the Bible warns us uh, to watch out for people that flatter you. <laughs> and um, especially when it comes to technology, I must admit that... Uh, Pastor Matt had to help me put on my headset properly because somehow it, I know it's supposed to come this side, but it, how to get it there. And then uh, to hide the cord from your sight and with the thousands of people that are watching on television today, I uh, did a quick behind the curtains to get the cord and I almost strangled myself in the process. So 
And then I was afraid the cord was going to break because I was pulling it too hard and uh, just so much stress these days. I'm pleased to be here and uh, God works in unique ways. And uh, my wife and I aren't the only missionaries whose lives have been put on hold or plans are changed. But ministry doesn't change because people are everywhere. And so not being able to go overseas means that I'm able to focus in Kamloops and Westside, my home church, and you simply have to say, Lord, you know, you're in charge, and we'll make our adjustments by your grace and your guidance. Uh, today's message I chose several months ago, Pastor Matt was gracious and asked a number of us to choose parables that uh, we were comfortable with and to give us openings as to when we might be available, and... The one that we're going to look at today, The Heart of Man, was my uh, second choice because I didn't know if he'd give me two opportunities. I thought, but he did say one or two. I actually gave him four, but I knew the three and four wouldn't make it. But just in case others had chosen or wanted mine, then I wanted to have backups. I like to be organized and planned in advance. But this was my number two about three or four months ago when I, I chose it. And life goes on, right? The last one was on the, uh, the speck and the log. And right as soon as I'd finished that, I started to put together this one. So the last long weekend, I began the message, finished it within a couple of weeks, and put it aside until this week, because I knew everything had been done. I'd even emailed it in the PowerPoint to the church so that I wouldn't get in trouble with Kelly or anybody else. So let's go to the next slide, please. The heart of man. The heart, as spoken of in Scripture, is the center of man's emotions, intellect, and will. Okay, so write that down in your little black book or on one of those fancy phones that I don't know how to use. Uh, this is the definition, biblically, of what the heart is, okay? So culturally, the heart has to do with our emotions when we use it loosely, unless you're going to a heart specialist. He couldn't care less about your emotions. He just wants to keep your ticker going. But in Scripture, when you see the word heart, it's talking about the essence of who we are. So it includes our emotions. It includes our intellect. It includes our will. When I talk to my students overseas about preaching, I tell them that a good teacher is not necessarily a good preacher. Uh, when I teach, sometimes I get passionate and I warn my students in advance. They say, now, I'm going to be lecturing you on this subject, but I might get excited and start preaching, so just be aware of that, okay? Because I'm a pastor speaking to pastors, and sometimes my students, they give me provocative type questions, and I start getting on a roll, and they're looking, and now they're excited, now they're awake, you know? And then I say, okay, sermon's over for the day, let's get back to the notes. So when you are teaching, it's more intellectual, it's content. And to be an excellent teacher, uh, you don't necessarily have to be an excellent communicator to the heart, because you're there for content. But when you're a preacher, content is extremely important. You're appealing to the mind, but you're also appealing to the emotions and to the will. And I make no apology for that when I preach. Um, as Pastor Matt diplomatically pointed out, I'm getting older. He could have actually said I'm old, but because he's polite, uh, he just said old. And we move from one stage to the other. You never know what life has around the corner. And not just that I'm getting older, but I don't know if this might be the last message that I ever preach. I may, ever, may never have another opportunity to preach the Word of God like I am this morning, so I have to preach it as though it's my last. And I'm not willing to come and just give you content, intellectual definition, a good definition. Please memorize it. There might be an exam next week at the barbecue. But I'm here today not just to teach, but to preach. And preaching involves the emotions and the will. And God has laid a message on my heart for you today. Next, please. 
Psalm 112, 178. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. Please make note of that. It will arrive at the conclusion if I actually make it to the end, because my track history here is I never make it to the last slide. So you'll have to go online, or this is my last slide as well as my first one. Blessed are those who fear the Lord. I presume you're part of that camp today, or why would you come here on a long weekend? Who find great delight in his commands. That's a little tougher one. Do you like obeying all of the word of God? Or do you kind of do spot checks here and there? If you don't like one verse, you flip to another section. Hopefully that one will turn out better. They have no fear of bad news. Wow. How do you handle bad news? Remember I said I prepared this message almost four weeks ago? I have it up here just in case I get scared and lose my, no, my place, or in case the technology breaks down, because I don't trust technology. So I laid them aside almost four weeks ago. A few days later, my wife has a problem with her eye. There's a little bit of bleeding, so she phones the optometrist, and he says, well, I don't really think there's a problem, but come on in, we'll check it out. He gets in there. And you might call it coincidence if you're not a believer. But there was nothing wrong with that particular problem. But he said, your eye pressure is so high, you could go blind right now, right this very minute. Whoa. Would you all agree that that's bad news? Like you're going along in life worried about this and worried about that, and you got COVID, and you got kids and grandkids, and... The garden's not turning out because of the smoke, and you got all kinds of pressures. You got too many zucchinis to get rid of, and I mean, you got all these important things, and all of a sudden, the man says, "You could go instantaneously blind." Okay, in the one eye. Not that her other eye is that great, but it's not as bad as the left eye. So he says, "I'm getting you into an eye surgeon immediately." And just coincidentally, the eye surgeon was there. He knows my wife. She has regular trips to him. And he looks at her. We got in within one hour. Can you believe that? And people complain about our medical system. One hour from the optometrist to the surgeon, he says, Alice, you stress me out. You could go blind right this very minute. And I can't do the eye surgery for you. It's a very... Technically, uh, we don't even have a machine to look at the problem you have. But I think it's such and such and such. And I'm sending you to Montreal General uh, Montreal, we used to live there. Uh, we, Vancouver, getting old, remember? The brain cells don't recall the right locations. But uh, Vancouver General Hospital, uh, we were there uh, within the week to be checked out. The surgeon said, I got to do surgery immediately can't do you this week, you got to come back next week. My next week was the week just before this Sunday. I lose track of time, also because I'm getting old. And so Monday, we took another long trip, five hours to Vancouver, got into the hotel, all the stress of all of that kind of stuff. Very next day, early in the morning, she was in surgery. I had two more appointments before we got back. Uh, She still can't see. Uh, There's a little bit of light, so that's hopeful. A little bit of shape. She'll say, David, can you just wave your hand? No, wave your hand. I am waving my hand, you know. Uh, She can't see. And as I stand before you today when I go home, I know she's going to be in pain. Um, I doubt that she'll be able to see, and yet I still have to preach this message. I'm here today as not one that has arrived, that can handle bad news. But you know what I had to do when I got back from, not Montreal, but Vancouver this week? Felt like Montreal. 
Thursday night, you know, you're tired out, you're wiped out, you got to preach on Sunday. I turn to my notes, and what do I see? People who fear the Lord will not have fear of bad news. And on Thursday and Friday, as I was struggling not only with what we're going through now, but other issues that came up in the last three weeks since I did this sermon, I am struggling with bad news. I am struggling with an attitude of my heart. And I'm saying, Lord, why do I have to preach this Sunday? Why couldn't it be postponed until I've got good news? And then I could stand before the people with strength and power and confidence and say, My God delivered us. And here's our testimony. She was blind, but now she sees. She sees men as trees walking now. But instead, I come as a fellow pilgrim along with you, and I'm sure you have some bad news today as well. And if you don't, my good news for you is that if you don't have it today, you'll have it tomorrow. Okay, so rejoice. You will have bad news, and if you can't identify with the message today and want to fall asleep, go ahead, but wake up tomorrow and look at the message on television because you're going to need it. And what this message told me on Friday morning is I'm readjusting to life in Kamloops and my zucchinis that have grown too big while we were away and all these stressful things I'm focusing on. You will have no fear of bad news. And I'm saying, Lord, why do you always make me practice what I preach? Lord, give me a break. Lord, let me just be a professor. Why all of this learning how to live the Christian life? Why can't I just be an academic? I can do that. But to learn along with everybody else, how to be a servant of Christ. To know that no matter how old I get, there's always changes. There's always bad news. When you don't like this bad news, you're going to get other bad news. And if you do stand up with a testimony, say, Jesus took away all my problems. My marriage is solved. I've got good kids and they're not in the hospital. Da, 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 da. Come to Jesus. I take away all your problems. Listen, folks, that's not biblical. You come to Jesus to get rid of your sin and to learn how to live a life without sin and to learn to live a life with problems and more problems and not necessarily to enjoy them, but to enjoy Him. And there is joy in suffering. And even as I stand here before you today, not knowing if my wife is going to lose one eye or maybe two eyes or who knows, maybe I'll be dead by the afternoon and it won't matter, the Bible works. But we have to apply the truth. Are you willing to apply the truth of the Word of God with me, your fellow pilgrim, who does not have the answers, who cannot always cope with day-to-day -day events, who is not always a successful overseas missionary, but it's had to learn to cope with failure and disappointment and even tragedy. That's the life of servanthood. And the only way to discover it is to give God your heart. Are you resisting that today? It's not me you're do doing a favor for. But you know this morning if your heart is where it needs to be, right? It's okay to struggle. It's okay to be angry, frustrated. COVID has just brought out the garbage in, in us that's already there. It's okay. But come to Jesus. Not for him to take away all your problems, no. But to let you cope with a joyful spirit, no matter what. Okay, just getting started here. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. The goal in this life is to be steadfast, not up and down 
like a yo-yo. Anybody here know what a yo-yo is? We used to play with them all the time. Some Christians are up and down like a yo-yo, praising God to the heights when things are going well and then going into despondency and leaving the church when things are going bad. Up again because Jesus answered their prayer and down again when some other things come along. That's not being steadfast. Steadfast is smooth. You know, smooth. We're not Jesus. But we should try to emulate his smoothness. Up a little bit, down a little bit. But constantly the heart is in tune with the Father. When the crowds are there, calling him to preach a great message again, to heal them. When the disciples are there as the political party advocates saying, Jesus, we put out all your signs, you know, and it's time to let the world know. We know we've got the political campaign going. We've got to fight the Herodians and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Romans, and you're the political leader, and you're probably the Messiah that's going to save Israel. Time to hold up the banners and let's get the votes from the people. And he said, no. I got to go and spend time with my father. And then when he finally did reveal himself, it was to do what that hymn said that we sang just a few minutes ago. He took our shame. He took the cross. And he sweat drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane while his disciples fell asleep because his vision was for your redemption and my redemption. And now we have hope. Now we can live this out. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. Next slide. The context, we always need the context. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Okay, we're not going to go back to the book of Leviticus today, especially on a long weekend, but you have to discern the difference between the laws of the Old Testament and the traditions, and that's an academic lesson we don't need this morning. Next one. Jesus' response, traditions versus the law. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? Some traditions are good. Some are kind of dumb. But when it comes to the truth versus people's religious traditions, there's only one way to go. I'm pleased that I live in the country of Canada where we have so many freedoms and kind of a, kind of a foundation base of Christianity that's still there. It's been eaten away at over the decades, but more or less our law system, our rights issues are more or less on a biblical foundation because of our history. We have a lot to be grateful for, but religious traditions you realize that apart from evangelical Christianity, every religion works towards good works. That's another course if you want to sign up for it. It's a tough one, but studying the religions of the world and looking at how you get salvation through the various religions, even Christian religions, are almost ultimately tied to good works. Live a good life, and you hope that you'll make it into heaven. Your faith and my faith, as we proclaim it here at Westside through the word of God, is that without Jesus, there's no hope. That we can rework the Old Testament laws, and we can add the New Testament laws, and we can add some of our own traditions that church should be only at 11 o'clock, we started at 10, so we kind of messed up there already. Um, you know, traditions, are you sitting in the right pew? That's how we say it in the old days, in the right chair today. Probably most of you chose the same chair that you normally sit in. I've now got a new one from post-COVID times here. Um, traditions, it has to be done a certain way. 
But God's word says, no. Next one. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament is different from the new. The new flows from the old, but the principles are the same. And this is one of those dynamic verses that you see the connectedness of how Jesus showing prophecy, showing principles from the old, because he came to fulfill the old. He didn't come to do away with the old, but you have to pick and choose what's fulfilled and what's left behind. That's another course for another day if you want to sign up for that one. But here it is, the principle is that the hearts of people are far from God, and whether you're in the Old Testament age or in the new, God is interested in the heart. The people chose King Saul, remember? Great, big, tall, husky, you know, brute of a man, handsome, and so forth. We want Saul. God said, okay, I'll, I'll give in to your request. And then God replaced Saul with David. And David became one of the great grandparents of Jesus. Better to take God's choices than man's choice. Why did God choose David? Well, we get into the sovereignty of God and, and all that, and that's another course. But God chose David, but from a human standpoint, he said that David was a man after my heart. And we look at David and say to God, you got to be kidding. There's got to be a better man than commits adultery and murder and has multiple wives and concubines, and has too many mules and donkeys and all the rest of it. And you say he's a man after his own heart? You read Psalm 51. It was preached in this church maybe a couple of years ago. Psalm 51. A broken man who paid a price. The child of Bathsheba died. His two sons came after him, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and they divided the kingdom. David ran from his family. And his one son with the long hair died, and he saw him, and his heart was broken. David knew misery, and many of David's problems were a result of his own sin and selfishness and self-determination. One in his rights, not anybody else's rights. Abusing his power and office taking his relationship with Jehovah God for granted. He deserved what he got. And then in Psalm 51, Oh God, I have sinned against you and against you only. When you and I sin against other people, when we harbor anger and bitterness in our hearts, when we won't forgive, when we want to rebel against our government, and disdain our health workers and all the rest of it. That's a problem of the heart. We can have our different issues, but when we're against one another, it's not that. It is a, a anger. It is a rebellion against God himself. And we can expect God's judgment upon us as a nation, and we can expect his, God, his judgment upon you and I as individuals if we don't get it. And you can be angry with God all you want but he's bigger than you. And if God has his finger on your life, like he did when I was eight years old, listening to my father preach, while I'm thinking about the football game with the New York Giants, and maybe it was the Philadelphia Eagles, doesn't matter because the Giants were the best in my mind, and Y.A. Tittle, anybody remember Y.A. Tittle? You can look, look him up in the ancient history books. My God, when my dad would preach, oh, the first part, kind of boring, you know, getting the context of the message, this and that. By the time he ended, I remember my dad sometimes, he couldn't walk down the front of the church and shake hands. He'd be hanging onto the pews because he'd exerted himself so much with the passion of the gospel. 
that got my attention. And as an eight-year-old boy, one of those sermons was about missions. And I came to my dad at the end of the sermon and said, Jesus wants me to be a missionary. When God puts his hand upon your life, watch out. You can either enjoy the ride and learn how to cope, or you can rebel against the pricks, the, the, the goads, the ox goads in the Old Testament, the KJV, the pricks were called the goads, you would goad with an ox. It's hard when, the Holy, when you kick against the pricks of the Holy Spirit and he's touching your heart for salvation, for consecration. And you're holding back. And you're saying, God, I will not surrender. I will not give up my free will. I will not give up my rights. I will fight. I will protest to the very end. Though I die in a hospital bed, I will not bend the knee to Jesus. And guess what? It's your choice. But if you respond, ah, now you got to learn how to live with the problems of life. You know, I get angry sometimes. It's not just at my zucchinis. Sometimes I get angry at Christians and I have to examine my heart. Why am I angry? Is it justified anger or is it just pride, self-righteousness? But when I see Christians that simply are acting like worldly people, you don't even know they're saved or not, I'm saying, what's wrong here? Maybe they're Christian, maybe they're not, but just because you throw a log on a campfire saying, I want to ask Jesus to be my Savior, doesn't make you a Christian. And I really get angry when I listen to some so-called Christian preachers who say, come to Jesus, and he'll take away all your problems. You know, I've been to Cameroon. I, go over I, have, I used to go regular to Cameroon for 10 years, Central Africa. And I'd be teaching, and there'd be this loud music going on beside us. And the charismatic evangelist would come in, and he'd promise healings to people. For $20 US, you can get healed. Mm. Next Friday, I didn't get healed, Pastor. Oh, well, there must be sin in your life. Come here, you know, and we'll lay hands on you and do some shouting, you know, and call down the Holy Spirit and all this kind of foolishness. Come to Jesus. There are no returns. I don't get my 20 U.S. back. Either sin in your life or because you're not praying sincerely. And so the fault goes back to the individual. And they go away heartbroken, guilt-ridden. Their child in a wheelchair is still in the wheelchair. I get angry. Because that's not the gospel. The gospel is maybe God will heal you. Ask for healing. Yes, no problem. And laying on of hands. We can do that even in the church. Or privately, if believers are there, there's nothing wrong with the laying on of hands. And asking God to heal. But... If it's your will, you don't make demands of God. You simply say, Lord, if it's your will, I sure wouldn't like, I sure don't want to lose the sight of my left eye, Lord. But if it's your will, somehow we'll learn to cope. Amen? The Bible even says if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It doesn't mean to do it literally, it's just if there's sin in our lives. Don't hang on to that which you are holding on to because it may be your doom. Whether it's your retirement plan, whether it's your plan for kids, whether it's your education, if you hang on to that and refuse to resist it and God is asking you to let it go at the altar, you will pay a price. And if I'm somewhat godly and in a good mood and not too angry at Christians on the particular moment, I'll say, I won't say, well, told you so, didn't I? Well, didn't you hear my message? I told you so, so it's your own fault. 
hopefully I'll have a little bit more grace and be able to say, well, you know, I'm a fellow pilgrim. You know what? You're looking at a guy who's lived six decades as a believer or more. I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. Welcome to the club. Next one. Boy, almost time to stop and I haven't started. Let's go. Next, we'll have to go quickly here. So he says, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. Next one. Then the disciples came and asked him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? And he replied, basically, to to summarize it, I couldn't care less. All right, that's a very loose paraphrase, okay? Don't follow that paraphrase, but read it for yourself. Next one. Peter asks for an explanation. And Jesus says, Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Next slide. This context, which you can read this afternoon, is based on Exodus 20, the second set of commandments in the ten, the first four about God, the second six are about man. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Here is Old Testament connected to New Testament. The Ten Commandments are still for today. We don't have to keep uh, Sabbath worship. We're allowed on Sunday because Sunday was, or uh, worshiping on Saturday was not prescribed. But the other nine, the principle of worship and rest are still for today. We can talk that later. But the nine commandments are just as strong for today as they were back then. He connects his teaching in this parable to the Old Testament. And he says, I did not come to destroy the Old Testament law. You are the ones that have destroyed it. You are the blind guides. You are using the Bible. You've memorized it, but you're not applying it. You're not interpreting it properly. And you need to be moved aside for a proper interpretation and an appropriate application. And then he moves on. Let's go to the next one. The problem is with the heart. An evaluation of the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? We were forced to memorize this verse way back, decades ago in seminary. I haven't quite forgotten it, but it has to be in the King James Version, okay? Okay. The heart is deceitful above all things, and in the King James it says, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand it? My friends, I don't know if you're believers here today or not, or those of you that are listening, but do you believe this first? Do you believe that the heart is desperately wicked? Or do you follow a lot of the worldly philosophy that man is basically good? When I went to university, that's what I was taught philosophy, psychology, science. Man is basically good. I still read my University of Guelph alumni paper. It still frustrates me at times. It's somewhat modified from my days, but it's more or less still the same. Science can save the world. Education can save the world. Moral education, getting rid of Christian ideas that are antiquated. The idea that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. Doesn't everybody know that you can have blended options, just pick and choose what you want? I mean, come on, folks. The heart has not changed. But Satan can deceive it in a thousand different ways. And if you and I are going to have an impact in people's lives, in our community, overseas, we have to get it straight. 
we must go counterculture with the truth and be hated for it and be hated for the truth. And part of our attitude should be that of Jesus where he says, those religious leaders, doesn't matter how many degrees they got, how big their following is on YouTube, they're telling lies. They're deceiving people. They're trying to get their money. They want power. And he's saying for you, don't worry about how much detergent you put on your hands post-COVID, pre-COVID. We have to wash our hands, but it's not going to make you clean. It doesn't matter if you're a strict vegetarian or you love going to McDonald's. It doesn't matter. We're free to choose. Don't let anyone trample on your rights when you line up for your Big Mac. You, know, you have rights. That's biblically sound, but... It's the heart. It always boils down to the heart. No matter what political party you want to vote for, shouldn't be contention between believers. It's, it's about the making a choice, yes, but then it's our heart. It's our attitude towards God and towards others. Next one. A remedy for the heart. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based merely on human rules that they have been taught. Where is your focus today in your worship? Is it on your traditionalism, whether it's Christian or some other religion? You have to decide. And based on the word of God... There's a day of judgment coming. And every one of these COVID people that are dying, along with so many others that are dying of regular normal stuff, when I read it, it's like the statistics. I can't keep track of all that. But every person, when I see a picture on the internet of somebody dying or somebody that's just died, you know, and they leave a little testimony behind, I can't help but wondering, are they with Jesus today? Are they with Jesus today? And then I look at my garden, and my focus is on my oversized zucchini. Big problem, right? And yet people are dying without Christ. Next. A commitment from the heart. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I'm not trying to sound morbid here this morning, but realistic. Coming to God requires mourning. Sorry. It does. We have to mourn over the darkness in our lives. The attitudes that are so corrupted, our worldliness, our sinfulness. And even if we've committed adultery and murder like King David did, there's still an opening to come back to God and mourn and wail and simply say, Lord, out of all the confusion, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been living for myself. I've been worried about me and my family and my kids and my money and my country. Lord, I come to you today with mourning, with a broken heart. May I, may I be allowed in humility to identify with my Lord in Gethsemane at the cross, not just at the resurrection. Because before the resurrection and the ascension and someday the glorification comes the morning. It comes a reality check. The crowds, they're phony. The political votes, they're phony. People hate me. They fight against God. They don't want my message. They want the healing. They want the tickling of the ears. 
But when it comes to the truth, only a few will be at the foot of the cross. A few women and a few men, and the disciples won't get it admit because their hearts were not right. They were carnal. They went back to the, their fishing. Why? Because they love fish? No, because they go back to what's normal, what makes them comfortable. I breathed a sigh of relief when we passed Merritt, not because we had to go through the fire zone because no fires that were tormenting us, but even my wife noticed I was much more composed once we were past Vancouver and Hope and Merritt. And it's almost like my SUV took off a little bit. Mind you, being a godly Christian, I would never go over 120, but... Sometimes in my exuberance, it might just go a little bit more towards 130 because I'm excited to be back where I'm comfortable. And after getting off those sometimes 40, 50 hour flights, four airplanes from Cameroon going through security that can be a little bit different at times, finally, you get to the airport and there's somebody there that you recognize. And you're coming along a street. Where's the traffic? Where's the honking? Where are the animals in the middle of the road? You know, it's, it's home. My house. No big fences. No guard outside with a machine gun. It's home. It's where I belong. I'm excited. And then God gives me bad news. More bad news. And now it's with my wife's eye going blind, like that's ongoing. Who knows what the testimony would be even next week. And it's like, Lord, I'm home, yes. But I'm not really home. Because my home is in glory. I'm not going to make it to the end today, but I'm going to ask you to pray with me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Lord, are there any here today or listening that don't yet know the name of Jesus in their hearts? In our culture, it's pretty pretty hard not to hear the name of Jesus, if not in cursing or on the net or in a book. But there's a big difference between hearing about Jesus and knowing him. Maybe there's some here today, Lord, that the first step is to weep and mourn for their sin, for their anger, for their going their own direction in life, that they need to repent and step out by faith and receive Jesus' salvation. Lord, if there's anyone here today on the way to hell, that they might turn from their sin and be saved. And Lord, maybe they're The rest of us here, the pilgrims, we're believers. We know we're believers, but maybe we've heard bad news. Or maybe we're wondering how we're going to respond the next time we get bad news because the last time we didn't do so well. Lord, help us to trust you until that day of sanctification arises. And the third category I would pray for today is maybe there are one or two or even more that you are speaking to about Christian service might be not so dramatic as getting on a plane and going overseas. It might be simply staying here in in Westside, Kamloops, and doing a ministry that you've been laying on their hearts. Maybe taking a theology course. Maybe reconnecting with a relationship that's broken down. I have no idea. But if your spirit is speaking to individuals today to make a special commitment of service or restoration, Lord, may he or she respond to that call and rejoice in having put that challenge behind. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, David, for uh, an incredibly challenging message on the heart. Uh, it's, it is amazing how Scripture is, is filled with it, how we can go through the motions. Right? I'm, we are all doing that this morning. We went through the motion of getting up and coming to church. We have sang some songs 
right? We can sit here and listen, but it all depends on where our hearts are at, right? We can go through those motions, and it can mean nothing, or it can mean everything. And so I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to close with one last song. And let me just encourage you, don't go just through the motions. Don't just sing along with the words that are on the screen. Engage your heart. Engage your emotions, your your intellect, your will. Choose to worship God. Choose to pour your heart out to him. Would you stand with me?
Amen. You can be seated. Right? Jesus is our king. And so that's the call, to have a heart that says, God, in all I do, I will honor you. Right? Again, not just going through the motions, not just putting out the, the actions and doing what we think we're supposed to do. As, as David said, that's most world religions, right? I'm going to try and be good enough so that when I get to that, the pearly gates, right, hopefully my good will outweigh my bad. That's not how it works, friends. It's not how it works. It's all dependent on the fact that Jesus has died for us. He took the punishment that we so deserved. And it's only by his grace that we can be saved. And so let's honor him. Let's love him. Let's glorify him in all that we think, say, and do. Well, again, thank you so much for joining with us this morning. I uh, want to let you know, if you have any questions about what's going on here at Westside Fellowship Church, please check out our website, westsidefellowship.ca. There's all kinds of information there, especially now that we're starting to get back into September. Uh, some of our different ministries are going to be starting back up again. Again, please give us patience. It's going to take a few weeks to get them rolling. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of information on our website. However, I do want to highlight a few things for you today, starting with a quick video update on Westside Kids. Take a look. Hi, Westside Church. I'm Anna. And I'm usually found upstairs with Westside Kids. Last month, we were finding out what it means to dig deep and search for wisdom. We've had so much fun learning how God's wisdom is a treasure worth searching for. Now we are launching into the vast cold void of space, and I am just over the moon about it. We're finding out what it means to take on new adventures with initiative. Initiative is seeing what needs to be done and doing it. It's amazing to watch a shuttle launch and think of all the hard work that went into making it possible. It takes teams of scientists and engineers, not to mention someone thinking of the idea in the first place. After all, a project like that takes more than just hard work, it takes initiative. As kids spend the month studying the life of Nehemiah, they will discover more about how we can reflect God's character through taking initiative. Nehemiah's life is a perfect example of someone who heard about a need, decided to check it out, trusted God, and dropped everything to finish the project. I can't wait to see how God helps our kids discover how they can show initiative in their lives. When we take initiative, that means that we're on the lookout for things that need to be done. And when we see a way that we can help, we launch into action without having to be asked. We'll launch into all that and more this month upstairs in Westside Kids for kids ages four years old to grade seven. Sign your kids in at the top of the stairs and we start at 10 every Sunday morning. See you at the launch site. Awesome. It looks like so much fun. I know all of you are hoping that we're going to start building rocket ships on our stage and have those kinds of cool decorations. You know what? They have a lot of fun up there, uh, a great team uh, of volunteers. And, and speaking of which, this idea of, of kids taking initiative and seeing something that needs to be done and doing it, that's not just limited to kids. That's something all of us can do. And so I'll, I just want to let you know, as we're getting things started, as we're starting up a bunch of our ministries again, we need volunteers. We need people to step in, help out, uh, however that looks. We need ushers and greeters. We need people who can push a button and make some coffee on a Sunday morning. We need uh, volunteers who are willing to invest themselves into youth, into the teenagers in our church and in our communities. I mean, we need volunteers all across the board. If you're a musician, we could use you up on, on stage. Don't worry. You'll be with a team. It's not scary. You can do it. Right? But we need volunteers in all kinds of different uh, areas and ministries in our church. And so if you're willing to take initiative and join with us in the work that we're trying to do here at Westside Fellowship Church, please talk to myself, talk to Kelly, uh, talk to Anna if you want to help out with kids. Let us know that you're interested in helping out, and we will do our best to try and find a place where you would like to volunteer, where God has gifted you and equipped you and created you to help give back, uh, even as many other people, like David did this morning, he came and he used his gifts to invest himself into us. And so if you're interested at all, again, please get in contact with us uh, and let us know how you want to help. 
I uh, also want to let you know and remind you that uh, there's all kinds of ways that you can partner with us financially. Uh, we are solely funded by your generosity. And, and I know a lot of people go, well, Matt, you're always asking for money. Okay, maybe. Maybe that's true. But, but friends, as David was saying this morning, uh, I'm asking not because we need it, although we do. That's not the number one reason why I ask. Uh, scripture is clear. Scripture is clear that we are to give because that's what God has called us to do. It's, it's actually a matter of the heart. It really is. Uh, in Second Chronicles, or sorry, First Chronicles 29, uh, David is praying. And he, he says to, to God, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Right? David recognizes that everything, the entire universe belongs to God because he made it. It's his. But listen to what David says next. He says, wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Friends, everything that we have is a gift of God. Everything that we have, our possessions, our money, the gifts, the talents, the abilities that we have, it is all a gift from God. And he calls us to give back, to use what he's given us, to honor him, to glorify him. How? As David mentioned, by loving each other and serving each other. Not just going through the motions, but with the heart of worshiping God with all that he's given to us. And so if you want to give and join with us financially, there's all kinds of ways you can give. E-transfer, you can mail in a check. Uh, we also have a Tidely app. And uh, for those of you here in person, we do have a, a donation box out in the lobby as well. Uh, a few other quick announcements before we wrap things up. Uh, next Sunday, we are actually a pre-polling station for the election. And so it's going to look a little bit different around here. We are going to have uh, some elections people out in our lobby, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And so for our Sunday service, I just want to let you know, parents, if you're bringing your kids, uh, we're going to ask that you actually bring them upstairs through our outside stairwell door, uh, kind of as we were doing it when we were uh, having our our group split because of COVID. Uh, if you can please use that stairwell. And for the rest of you, as you're coming in, we're actually going to invite you to come in through these double doors here. Uh, just so that we can keep, try and keep the lobby as empty and uh, clear as possible for the election. Um, we, for our worship services, are not required to have masks. However, I would encourage you to bring a mask next Sunday as we do want to respect uh, the people who are doing the election stuff. So if you need to use the washroom or go into the lobby kind of thing, please you know, wear a mask in that area as well. Just another way that we can uh, love and serve in our community. And uh, finally, I uh, wanted to let you know that our, our barbecue, our kickoff barbecue is going to be happening on September 26th, okay? September 26th, um, we are going to have our worship service like this, and then afterwards, you are invited to stick around. We're going to have a barbecue. Uh, it's going to be a great time of just hanging out, eating some food, and uh, wrapping up our, our worship gathering together by eating together. I think that's everything that I need to uh, let you know about. There's going to be more announcements in the coming weeks as things are getting going again, uh, but we'll leave it at that. So, again, thank you so much for coming out, and uh, I do want to close with one more big thank you. Uh, if you, some of you might have noticed over this last number of months, we've been having a little bit of a construction project right behind the church here, uh, and uh, yeah, Daryl and his team have finished the uh, the garage, uh, something that was necessary. Um, according to our fire department, that we needed to build. And so they built that structure. They spent many weeks on it. Uh, so a big thank you to everyone who helped out. But, of course, a huge thank you to Daryl and Ray, who were a huge part of that. So thank you guys for that. Uh, yeah, it looks great. Make sure you take a look on your way out if you haven't seen it. And we're going to throw some pictures up there just so you can see kind of what that process looked like. Um, yeah, so thank you uh, to all of you and uh, for Ray and uh, Daryl who invested so much time, work, and energy. We do have a little gift for them that we'll give to them uh, when we see them next. So anyways, God bless. Have yourself a great week, and we will hopefully see you next Sunday.